Hello traders, it's Tuesday, May the 31st. This is John Kicklighter, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. Here to give your FX market wrap-up for the opening 24 hours of trade this week, as well as an out for what we can expect in, 20, in the next 24 hours ahead of us, which happens to be the final 24 of this month. Now, as expected, we started off on a relatively quiet note. Uh, we had uh, holiday trading conditions uh, for the U.S. and U.K., and that certainly was a significant curb on activity uh, throughout the entire world. We know that there is a, a cumulative risk orientation and when you have the absence of a major uh, combination of players like this it does inevitably uh, curb the ability to generate momentum. So that would leave many of the markets pretty much at the technical boundaries that we've been tra and tracing out. The Euro USD obviously is uh, one of the majors that I am most interested in to start off this week. You had the 200 day moving average, the midpoint of this range going back to 2015, uh, the beginning of 2015. You have this rising trend channel floor, so a nice combination, a nice uh, confluence, not making a definitive decision, bullish or bearish, until we actually have something uh, that can come along and catalyze it and f uh, certainly the liquidity to support it. The same would be true of a pound dollar reversal, an Aussie USD attempted a reversal, uh, even pairs like the Euro pound which I'm very interested in, non-standards like the uh, Euro Aussie which we uh, gave a little bit of attention to uh, through the end of last week. A good tactical opportunity that is a daily chart of consolidation. I was trying to play this as a reversal, but it never took traction. So I'm glad I got out. Even if it was a loss of 150 pips, I just wanted to get out because it wasn't doing what I expected. Clearly, this is an opportunity once a strong catalyst comes along and we have liquidity to support it. Pound CAD is another tactical. This is a four hour, uh, so shorter term chart. None of this would be able to mark good pace. Uh, certainly not a breakout, but that doesn't mean that everything was as stoic. We did have some remarkable performance, I think, in the risk orientation. Now, you can't really see it too much here in the S&P 500, uh, besides the fact that we did mark yet another green bar through Monday's session. But this was uh, certainly a risk appetite uh, move that would hold broader influence. So it wasn't just the S&P 500 or U.S. equities that were advancing. We also had European markets that would advance. Now, of course, the... FTSE 100 would be closed, but you have the DAX, a slow advance. And Asian equities were actually doing better than would be anticipated, given that there was a clear lack of uh, momentum that would come from the latter sessions. Now, this positive performance from the Nikkei 225, we often look at the correlation between the Nikkei 25 and the yen cross, particularly the dollar yen, and we would not be disappointed in seeing this because the dollar yen was right there at its technical boundary. So this advance actually provided a break. Now the question becomes, is this a, a break with profundity? Is this, is this something that actually has carry-through potential? It can carry through, but it's not going to be because of this break. All right, that's how I see it. This can be a profound break only because it does offer a first step, but then subsequently the momentum would come from whatever the, sub the subsequent uh, drivers or catalysts will be when liquidity once again fills out. So if all of a sudden there's a risk appetite run across assets, across uh, the entire financial system starting Tuesday, that would definitely carry the dollar yen up. But it's not be going to be because that we had this technical break during thin liquidity that would motivate it. And s certainly, if we have risk aversion, even if it's mild risk aversion, in the subsequent sessions, in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, this technical break will matter for very little. All right. In the scales of technicals versus fundamentals, which is a very uh, significant rivalry when establishing uh, trade confidence, the technicals will not be able to stand up to any fundamentals that come along and say risk aversion. This will be torn down and proved to be a false breakout very easily. All right, so I don't look at this and I don't see an op I don't look at this and see an opportunity. 
not even just because I don't have or I have my long-term views on risk trends and I've been short dollar yen since 116 and I'm expecting this to play out in a much bigger time frame uh, not just uh, through the yen crosses obviously but through all things that have a systemic risk sensitivity and that includes uh, equity markets and all those other things that are on my uh, risk measurement my relative performance risk measurement here And that's my big picture view of the dollar yen, but that's not the only thing that holds me back from the dollar yen playing to the upside. I uh, don't have uh, any uh, inherent problem with playing a short term view to the long side of dollar yen and then uh, staying committed to a long term uh, risk aversion theme. Right? Trading different time frames uh, shouldn't hold you back from the markets. If you have a big picture long-term trade and it seems to conflict with the very short term, unless you want to micromanage a long-term trade with very short-term actions, it's better to do both in separate time frames. All right, so maybe I'll make a strategy video out of that. But there are other yen crosses that did have what would be considered uh, more tactical opportunity. I, I mean, even if uh, getting rid of the conflict on the dollar yen in my long-term view here, the euro yen, all right, short-term trend line break here, uh, back up into a more meaningful technical level. So perhaps this one's a, a poor example of one where you might be motivated to be more bullish. Uh, pound yen, certainly very important. Inverse head and shoulders pattern neckline here. I mean, arguably, depending on where you're putting up the neckline, we could potentially have broken this or are very close to it. This is one that would demand commitment if you're going to go for a, the technical pattern, looking for that reversal. But I am not confident in the break that was made uh, during those circumstances. And this would really be a committed view of risk appetite trends, and I cannot get behind a risk appetite move. Even if I do find, let's say, more confidence in the pound, I would prefer to play a lasting advance in the pound in something like the pound dollar, not the pound yen. There is too much uh, headwind for this to make anything of substance. The pair that I was most interested in is the Euro, uh, the sorry, the Aussie yen. You can see the short-term wedge formation with a break to the upside. Uh, this would move us back into a broader range. The top of the range, uh, arguably, uh, when we see the big picture, goes all the way to the top of this descending trend channel. So that can actually stretch quite far. But that I take this trade, even considering it's a tactical trade. No. Tactical means short-term to me. But I'm still mindful of the time frame and momentum. This is a short-term break, absolutely, of the wedge. But follow through is going to take at least a couple of days. And the first day is a break. I could have taken this. I was actually watching it when it occurred. But I didn't take it because I don't see the second day obviously uh, fo following right behind. Right? It doesn't in a clear way say that there is a risk on move here that actually has momentum. No, the genesis of this move is questionable at best. So I didn't take this trade, and I'm not particularly confident that this is a tactical opportunity that's going to feed itself. Same is true of the Kiwi Yen, which hasn't been able to clear its range, or the Cad Yen, which is the same, hasn't been able to clear its range. So this is one of those instances where you look across the many crosses, and when, let's say, 9 out of 10 of the major pairs for a currency uh, force a serious break, a technical break, there's a good probability that there's going to be fall through there. But when I'm only looking at the Aussie yen as being, uh, Aussie yen and dollar yen as being serious breaks for the pound yen is uh, very questionable. Euro yen is already at its resistance along with CAD yen and Kiwi yen. I'm dubious that there is going to be that kind of fall through. Even regardless of the fundamentals, which I know a lot of people want to try to leave out because they are too complicating. But this aggregate does not speak to a very uh, confidence inspiring move. Now, if we have risk appetite come Tuesday, all right, looks like it's going to fall through. It, I would be quite surprised, given that we are so close to boundaries on profound benchmarks like the S&P 500, but hey, can't deny it. If we do have risk appetite, I'm going to be looking at those that have, uh, or those assets, those currency crosses that have room to move to the upside, not the S&P 500. You get to systemic questions of confidence uh, near record highs. But if I'm looking at something like the Aussie yen, 
then yes, that can have follow-through. If you don't like it because it's already made its break and you want the occasion or the break to match the momentum, then a Kiwi Yen and a Cad Yen might be better suited. They're at their uh, boundaries, and if they get the break with momentum, then you still have the upside move. Once again, still tactical. So I'm going to be watching this very closely, but a positive thing uh, transitioning from Monday to Tuesday is liquidity is certainly going to fill out. And it fills out with a ton of event risk that is going to start a essentially a torrential rain of news. And that's going to be good for tactical opportunities as well as potentially even generating some traction in systemic moves. I'm very interested in what the dollar is going to do. If you join me for the, uh, the weekly Fundamental Outlook uh, conversation that we had for the webinar, uh, the dollar ended off this past Friday with a lurch higher, and there was the gap up to start Monday that was in no small part contributed to by the dollar yen. We still have some very profound resistance above. Uh, there's the midpoint on this uh, peak high in January down to the low in April. That's right about where spot is where we closed off uh, Monday's session. You also have the 200-day moving average. So I'm a little bit more, uh, I'm a little bit more cognizant of. I think that it carries a little bit more influence. It, it does uh, m have that greater uh, correlation, or cor it's a, at least a corollary to the Euro USD 200-day moving average below price and pound dollar 200-day moving average up at 147.50 is it happenstance that there is a profound uh, moving average uh, technically derived. All right, so this is price derived. It's on this chart. It shouldn't statistically have a immediate relevance to the euro USD, which is an equally weighted index of these other four currency crosses, but it does. All right, so it does carry more uh, influence to me. But the dollar has been on a tear three, almost four weeks now, and it, it has no small part due to uh, relative monetary policy, a revival of interest rate expectations as the market is thawed on that uh, Fed hike in 2016. And the Fed's trying to still get us to get to the two Fed hikes in 2016 view. They will likely continue this pressure in Fed speeches, though we do have fewer Fed speeches. We started off uh, with the Fed speech in uh, the Asia session Monday. Bullard, who actually, uh, I think he sets a little bit of an issue in that uh, the expectation that the market is prepared for a rate hike. I think that they are not prepared for a rate hike. Uh, I think that's quite clear when we look at uh, monetary policy and the Fed funds futures forecasts say that uh, the markets aren't even pricing in a rate hike through the end of this year. That's not, you know, one hike in 2016 and you're still debating the second hike. That's not even pricing in the first hike. Right? So there is still considerable premium that can be had here. Uh, for the dollar, but there's also a considerable amount of risk in that they are not uh, appro uh, appropriately uh, preparing the market, and the bigger the surprise of a Fed rate hike, the greater the fallout is going to be in a uh, disruptive way to the financial system. All right. But I'm going to be watching uh, the shorter term aspects here of the U.S. dollar and see if this interest rate expectation wave can continue. We will in the upcoming session have the Fed's favorite inflation indicator, the PCE. Uh, we'll see after two, day, two months of decline whether this has a pickup. I did note uh, through the weekend video that energy prices, or maybe it was the TOF, uh, the energy prices did have a significant advance through April, about 19%. So that can have uh, a very significant impact on the price gauge as energy prices are a very important element of it, especially the headline reading. If we do see an uptick in inflation pressures, that would uh, immediately put us back out to forecasting what happens on Friday with non-farm payrolls, but that would be in itself enough to potentially generate rate expectations for uh, a June, uh, or more likely from the skeptics' perspective, July as a early rate hike. All right, so dollar looking good fundamental event risk ahead and it's not just from an aggregate perspective and a pure fundamental evaluation perspective you have some pretty profound uh, technical opportunity here now this is the better positioned currency pair for a dollar advance although I guess it can perform in the event of a dollar decline uh, but 
pound dollar and Aussie dollar, I think, are uh, the more remarkable should the dollar decline. You'd crack more subs uh, substantial levels. Aussie dollar in terms of reversal, the pound dollar in terms of the 200-day moving average to the upside and complete a major reversal. Uh, but you can also play the uh, quieter, more limited move, and that would be, I think, just as systemic if the dollar does advance and close the pound dollar back to the bottom of its range, the 100-day moving average. We'll see. We'll see what the market has to offer. Aside from risk in dollar, all right, we do have quite a bit of event risk on the docket. Asia event risk in terms of Japanese employment and spending, Australia uh, trade, although be mindful that we have the GDP figure uh, the following day, so this, that's much more systemic. Uh, we have German employment, Eurozone employment, uh, inflation figures, emerging market activity with India GDP. All right, lots of data on the docket. These are all very capable of generating short-term volatility for the respective currencies. And looking for volatility alongside technical standings, I think, is the more rewarding uh, approach right now because these are more systemic rather than fundamental trends that we are developing. Uh, I do, uh, and I have been keeping a close eye on the short term, like the Aussie yen cross. I do think that the pound Kiwi, the pound Aussie are uh, maybe in the middle of a short term versus a medium term trade perspective, although they still more heavily aligned to the medium term. But you can see the con congestion after their remarkable rallies. I think that that could be a uh, momentum play if there is a specific uh, direction chosen. Not a lot of UK event risk with the kind of uh, remarkable influence that we would need for a really key trend. And remember, we're getting closer and closer to Brexit. Instead, I'll be looking at the pound CAD four-hour chart, head and shoulders pattern. It could uh, resolve with a break to the upside. I would be less inclined to trade it. Uh, the path of least resi resistance is a move below 190, uh, which would be ultimately limited, but that aligns more nicely to the opportunities that we have. Euro pound might also have a drive from this. I'll, be, I'll watch it, and I do like it fundamentally, but I am quite concerned about what Brexit's going to do. Not that it's going to, you know, motivate the currency pair up and set it down and reverse this in a more systemic way, but rather it's going to drain a lot of the conviction either direction from the pound, and that's going to make difficult trading conditions. Another uh, that I was looking at earlier, this is the Euro Aussie. I tried to trade this as a reversal after consolidation, but this consolidation has gone on longer than I had anticipated. I'm glad I did sit on the sideline. Uh, I have ultimately durations that I put on my trades. I have to have a trade happen at a certain period of time or I get out. And that's because if the trade is not playing out as anticipated, it is no longer my trade and it ultimately becomes hope and you try to avoid hope as much as possible in trading. But this consolidation is quite remarkable. We are now, uh, after this extended period of quiet, uh, we're looking at a range of about 100 pips, which is really quiet in terms of the Euro Aussie. In fact, it's the quietest we've seen since back here uh, during the holiday uh, period or hours between December and January, December 2014, January 2015, when you expect it to be quiet. Before that, it was the uh, remarkable and ongoing quiet that had hit you know, uh, through the summer months of 2014, which was quiet for all of FX, and uh, really before the euro started rocking and rolling. I don't think we're going to get that quiet again. I think that these markets are going to move in a more significant way, as it's been uh, the case over the past couple of years. Uh, it just needs that catalyst. What's the catalyst? We'll wait and see. But I think Aussie GDP stands as a very, very big one. I don't know if German and Eurozone employment are going to be capable of making this break. But this is just one of a few uh, or a number of currency crosses that have uh, really attractive short-term technical appeal to them. You can see many of them are out there. You just have to look around. They're not always going to be the center of attention, uh, but their technical bearings certainly do warrant attention. All right, so we'll all... I still maintain a tactical view in the markets, even as liquidity starts to fill out. But thankfully, liquidity will fill out after the holiday session. We'll see if there's going to be a little bit more uh, motivation on technical moves, perhaps even the beginnings of a more profound trend. But I'll hold off judgment until we actually see those. I don't want hope to get ahead of me. All right, we'll wrap it up here.
We will do our next uh, rundown and outlook of the market tomorrow. Until then, I wish you good luck trading out there.